Welcome to another edition of Stand Alone, where we go over what does it really take to start leading your life? You know, when you look at the world today and everyone's looking to get better, there comes a time where you have to start seeking from yourself, what are the answers to making the best version of you? And so when I seek out people to bring to you guys, I'm looking for the best of the best. Who can we learn from? You know, people that have had a proven track record. So today I have a special treat for you. We're going to talk about something that a lot of people want a lot of help with, and that's relationships. We're going to tie it into relationships, how it relates to leadership, leading our lives, and then also how does it connect to fitness too, because our body has an effect also. So today I have Chris Barthelme with us today. And when you think about someone that is an army ranger, an ex army ranger, you are an army ranger trainer. Now you're in a business. Is it your business on, on your own, Chris? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, um, it's a motivational speaking company slash, uh, coaching company all in one. I love that. So like, you know, for, for me, when I go to seek answers, I want someone with a proven track record, someone who's done hard things because, you know, life is not supposed to be easy. And most of us, Chris, we're looking for like the easiest path, the path of least resistance. And I've always intuitively known that this is not necessarily the path that's going to lead us to our best life. But as we dissect into this, I first wanted to ask you about your background and go over you know, how did you go from being an army ranger? What did that cultivate inside of you that then led you to be someone who can speak to people and be a life coach and help people heal from within? So my military experience came from 2005 going on, um, joined the army. And I've always wanted to do whatever I do in life. It's always, I want to be the best at it. I want to do the hardest. I want to challenge my mind, challenge my body and see how far I can push myself. So I got in the army, army said, okay, we're gonna send you to combat. It was great, I got shot at, we had all sorts of harrowing experiences, but it still didn't offer me that like, that release, that pushing past my limits and saying, look what I just did. That, that look back where you're like, I just did 62 days of the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. So that's when I decided to go to ranger school. It's 62 days if you make it straight through. So you can recycle some of the phases. So some guys end up down there for 90, 100, 120, and sometimes even full year down at that school and not allowed to leave. So if you keep recycling, you're going to be there for a long time. So my mentality going down was I'm going to push. I'm going to push. And I'm going to finish this thing straight through, not going to have any recycles. I'm going to make sure I absorb every little bit of information they give me. And then I'm going to translate it into use, basically. And I was pretty successful. I went straight through 62 days, no recycles, no issues, no injuries even, because that's another one too. You can get injured down there too, which can then set the process back too. Um, went straight through, graduated. And that's when I found, I'm like, okay, I'm in, I'm in an elite class at this point of people that have pushed through one of the hardest schools on the planet, right? And went back to combat and I had some harrowing experiences. I lost a soldier um, mainly to my own arrogance. Um, we were on a patrol. Uh, we were told the house was rigged to blow. I made some mistakes that morning and it cost a man his life. And so after that moment in my life, I decided I'm not going to make those type of mistakes because I'm going to actually think about my actions. I'm actually going to discover myself. I'm going to see why I was so arrogant in those moments because I thought, oh, I had been to ranger school. So that translates into I know better than a lot a lot of other people in situations. So I decided, you know what? It's time to take the deep dive inside of me. I mean, when you lose a soldier, it triggers emotions in you that you didn't know you had. So I had to dig deep and then realize that it was my fault, admit that it was my fault, and then learn how to get past that without dealing with all the grief of beating myself up for years. You know, it took me almost 10 years to get through that part of my journey from 2007 to about 2017. So at that point, um, after the, the explosion, after Rod died, I came back to the States. I decided I couldn't handle combat anymore. I was like, I'm done. 
please put me in a position where I'm, I'm not in combat and I need to, I need to let myself decompress. So the army sent me to the uh, ranger school as an instructor. And that's when I found my purpose. I realized that my ability to translate to other people, the topics that we're talking about, then seeing what it was that they needed to be able to push past their own limits. I could see straight through them. I could see, okay, this is their motivator. This is their why. Now, how do I translate that into a, a position where it's going to motivate them and not get them to set backwards, basically? So during my time in ranger school, I honed those skills of, of really mentoring kids. Because I call them kids because most of them are in their 19s, 20s, 21, 22 years old, usually, straight mm -hmm. out of college or you know straight out of basic training. And they're, they're having to push their body past where they ever thought it would be. And they want to quit. They want to give up on themselves. So we can't allow them to. We have to make them push past it. So being able to say, okay, this guy is motivated for this reason. Now I've got to be able to talk to him in a way that's going to get him motivated to take that next step, to push past that limit, to do that thing that he didn't think he was going to do. So that's when I realized I had a real skill at figuring people out and then figuring out how to teach them in the best way that they're going to learn, not trying to relate the material or not trying to re them relate to the material. I try to relate the material to them. And that's where the actual learning happens when you can relate it to them in a way that they understand it, then they understand their own motivator. And it's like the, the light bulb goes off and they're able to push past whatever it is. Take that going forward. I decided to get out of the military in 2013. After that, I, I've done various leadership roles, uh, usually in public utilities, things that are labor intensified jobs in the maintenance industry. I've held regional supervisor positions, um, both field supervisor for the utilities and regional maintenance supervisor for the uh, maintenance side of a couple of different companies. And everywhere I go, I put my systems in place. You know, I kind of get them the, the next step. I cultivate the leaders underneath me. And then I look for the new challenge. And in 2022, I decided the next challenge was taking my leadership abilities and my ability to understand people and have that empathy that I think it takes to be able to coach them. I took that and said, I'm going to start coaching people. I've always had fitness and nutrition as like a side hustle that I've always done because I do have degrees there. And so I was like, okay, let me translate that to a little bit more. Cause I had several clients that were like, I want more from you. And I'm like, well, I, I've, I've got fitness and nutrition. I, I do both of those two. They're like, no, I, I want you to give me advice on the rest of my life. I'm like, yeah. Well, I don't even know what that looks like. So I just started small. I did things that I knew that I could coach somebody on, which was, hey, how do I get through college? You know, I had a lot of soldiers coming to me that I had, that I had been an instructor for. And they're like, look, I need your help getting through college. I'm like, you don't need my help. You've been through ranger school. And they're like, no, I need your way of, of helping me understand it. You know, so I took that and I started coaching people through college or big life changes. I want to make a job change. I want to do this. I want to do that big life change type stuff. Right. And then it slowly started translating into me realizing that a lot of people can't make those translations and they can't make those changes and they can't figure stuff out because they don't know themselves first. They don't know anything about themselves. So then I started getting more into the relationship side. I started taking workshops. I started taking classes. I started listening to podcasts. I started talking to other therapists and trying to learn what the brain is doing and why it's doing it. And I started realizing nobody knows themselves. They say they do. And then when you ask them guided questions to try to figure it out, they're like, well, I don't know. I'll just, I'll figure it out when I get there. And I'm like, that's never a course of action here. We have to know what steps we want to take to get there. So I took the leadership mold that the, that the military gave me. This is how you break down a problem. This is how you get the steps for a problem. And I started applying that to how do we know ourselves so we can present ourselves better in a relationship. And bingo, that's when it happened. I started getting clients by the droves. My, my, my schedule right now is pretty much booked up and it stays booked up because I've got more referrals than I can handle at this point of people that want to learn themselves and learn how to apply it in a relationship in a healthy manner. Yeah, I love this. So number one, uh, thank you for your service. You know, thank you for what you've given in terms of to this country it allows me to do what I get to do. Uh, I don't take that lightly. 
And, and number two, thank you for your continued service. You know, one of the greatest things about people in the military is that you're so highly trained, you're so highly skilled with discipline. And when you can translate that to people in the civilian world where, you know, we need these type of disciplines, it's so beautiful because when we apply and we can execute on this, we can live a better life, especially in business, you know, top people, we're always looking for someone to make us better. It never stops. And so for me, I'm seeking the best in the world at what they do to say, how can you speak to me? How can we cross pollinate? And how can I take what you've learned, apply it to my business to make it grow? And then especially for myself. And so you know, thinking about you starting in fitness and then translating into relationships, I just wanted to talk quickly before we go into relationships about the mind and the body connection, you know, because for a lot of people, when we put on excess weight, when we are finding ourselves in this situation where we don't really take care of ourselves and we really, we have one body. And I see this in top performers, like how is it that we are a top performer in our business, but we're overweight, we're unhealthy. And I say this from experience, you know, you're just, you're neglecting yourself. Is that something that is happening in the mind? What is happening to our relationship with ourself when that happens? I think a lot of it stems from the fact that we we think we know what we want and we start pursuing that. And we we get so hyper focused on our job that we forget there are other parts of the body. And it's you see it in a lot of top performers that when they get to 30 or 40 years old, like look at um a lot of like biz business mo moguls, right? They get to the top of their thing and then they kind of disappear. You don't hear from them again. You know, they, they do all the great stuff with their business. They sell off their businesses at 40 and 50 years old that have, that have started from scratch. And they do that because they're just burnt out because they don't realize that they're focused, they're hyper-focused on their business. They don't realize it's, it's an all-inclusive thing. Your body is going to take a toll and then you end up having health problems. You end up having, you know, not necessarily cancers, but you have all sorts of things like Crohn's disease, which happens when you don't eat the right foods and you have all sorts of other blood pressure issues, and all of that stuff stems from having to be hyper-focused at your job and not taking the time to have the proper nutrition, not having the proper hydration, and not basically not doing anything to better your health at that point. You're, it's a piece of the puzzle. You know, If you want longevity, it's one of the, the pieces of your puzzle, and they're just completely neglecting it at that point. Yeah, I, I think too, we always think, well, we have you know, we can worry about that in the future. Like right now, let me just perform, let me get the results. And then what I've learned from, you know, people with a, with a military background, I work with a lot of Navy SEALs and they are always like, keep it simple. Just do the same thing every single day, every single day, every single day. And it's just, it's repeat, repeat, repeat. And so, you know, when we get into the relationship part of it, we talk about like increasing our self-awareness, but, you know, I always say this to my team, Chris, I always say, you know, why relationships are so important is because it really does directly affect the quality of life that you have. And so if you're not working on that, you know, especially as a business owner, if you can't have good relationships with people it actually takes a toll on you. It takes a toll on your business. Um, so I want to, I want us to really spend some time on this today because a lot of people think like, okay, I'm, I'm in business. What, what does relationships have to do with my business? You know, and it, it really has so much to do with it. So when did you start to see that deeper connection of, listen, um, you have relationship issues or was it your clients that came to you and said, uh, no, I want more from you? Did you see the connection first or did your clients see it for you? Um, my clients actually saw it for me. They're the ones that started seeing that the discipline and the consistency that I had in the fitness side of things was slowly starting to translate into what they were doing in their other part, parts of life. And they said, I want to get better at all these other aspects of my life. And uh, when you start taking a look at the broader spectrum of all of life, it is all relationships. Every last bit of what we do, family, well, those are relationships. If you want to love life, those are relationships. If you want to be in business, those are relationships. 
everything we do revolves around other people. And so we want to get great in our mind about, oh, I've got all the knowledge on how to do X, Y, and Z. But if you can't cultivate good relationships, you're leaving money on the table. Because at that point, you're saying, I can do everything myself. Because if you can't have a healthy relationship, you cannot motivate others to help you in whatever cause that you're going for. Whether it's you know business for, for something in Silicon Valley, or whether or not you're running something in the fitness industry, you're gonna, it's going to take people to do everything that you're doing. Especially if you want to grow to multi-million dollar businesses, you're going to have to have a plethora of people underneath you and you're going to have to know how to direct them. And you can't just direct them by saying you do it. And, you know, because I said, so it doesn't work. You know, you have to understand how the interpersonal relationships work and that it's a give and take. That's the word, the word relationship. That's what it means. So just because you're the leader, that doesn't mean that you don't have a part to play in their life just as much as they have a part to play in your business. So seeing that portion of it and saying, okay, it's time to start looking at relationships on a broader spectrum and seeing how we can apply all of these to everything that I realized it was all self-awareness. It's all realizing what we're saying to people, why we're saying it, and then making sure that we're saying it in a manner that they can understand. Once we do that, all of our relationships start to get better, not just romantic. That's the one I use a lot because the one most people can relate to. But once you start talking about things like boundaries, how do we set boundaries? Well, I got to set them in business too. No, I'm not going to do that contract because of X, Y, and Z. But when we start learning how to do it in romantic relationships where there's a lot more emotion involved, it's easier to translate to business because at that point you're like, I'm taking a lot of the emotion out of it when I deal with, with a business transaction. I can be a little more stern because I don't have to have, I don't have to worry about love or all these other emotions. I don't have to worry about being vulnerable. I can straight up say, this is what's going to happen. So it translates to that. And there's so many topics that end up translating that direction from like love relationships into the business world. And then in family too, you know, you have, you've got to set boundaries with family, but we don't, a lot of times we let family take, 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 take. And then we're drained because they're always asking us to beat all these events. And you don't realize that that's part of it too, that you have to learn how to take a step back, take a deep breath, prioritize what you have in your life, but you can't do that if you're not setting healthy boundaries. So that all ends up translating into every relationship. It permeates into everything. And then your quality of life starts going up when you realize you can interact with people on healthier levels. You can get more out of them to help you. You can give more to help them. And everybody, it, it's that symbiont circle. If I help you and you help me, we both elevate faster. But when we try to do things on our own because we don't know how to have healthy relationships, we end up running ourselves into the ground completely. What would you say is the role of our relationship to ourself? Like for me, um, you know, I'm really big on a person being, that's what self-awareness is. Like, are you aware of yourself? You know, before we get into a relationship, how important it, is it to know yourself, to spend that time with yourself, to be comfortable with yourself so that you can then enter a relationship with another person and then get to know them. And you're not doing it from a place of hurt because you've worked out all those things, even though none of us are perfect. We're never fully healed. We're still, you know, now intermingling with someone else and bumping up with their problems and then solving those. But what is the role of taking that time for yourself um, I've done a lot of work on this, you know, just to make sure that I'm healed from within. Could you talk about this from your experience with working with people? Like, are we just jumping into relationships and, and blaming other people and not really doing the work on ourselves? What's happening there? The main problem I see is that the blame game gets started right away in a relationship, just yeah. weeks into it. We blame the other person. And a lot of times when I start asking just gentle questions, you know, like, why do you think you reacted that way? Because I use a style called motivational interviewing. And by doing that, I'm just going to let them talk to me and tell me what their issues are. And as I start guiding them through it, they start saying, well, I shouldn't have reacted that way. And then I'm like, okay, so you're blaming him for everything, but your reactions weren't on, on par either. You were reacting negatively to him too. And then I ask him, why were you reacting negatively? And a lot of times they don't know. And I'm like, if you don't know why you reacted negatively, you don't know yourself. And if you don't know yourself, you have, you have nothing to stand on as far as your confidence. You're, you're basically like a, a, an animal that's backed into a corner 
and you're just, you're doing everything you possibly can for, for dear life. And I noticed a lot of people are in this, they call it the sympathetic response of the nervous system. We're in fight or flight and it's happening. It's becoming more common that people are getting three, four five weeks into a relationship or even three, four five months. And they're, they're having big blowout fights in relationships. They can't control their emotions. And a lot of times it's they're stuck in fight or flight from a previous relationship. And a lot of times they don't even know it. And it's dangerous because then we start labeling people as you're toxic, you're all these things. When they're not really toxic, they're just suffering from something that they have not dealt with from a previous relationship. So doing that self-awareness opens up. It's not saying we're going to open those wounds, but we're going to look at our reasoning why we are the way we are, you know? And when I've done that in the, in the most recent couple months, I've noticed a lot of people attach their confidence to ideas instead of into their values. And so we look at what your values are. We look at what your needs are and how those things all align. And once we understand that we can communicate it, if you don't even know what your needs are, how can you even, how can you even tell your partner, this is what I need in a relationship, you know? And it's, it, it makes communication difficult when what you're supposed to be communicating on in a relationship is yourself and you're, you can't because you don't even know yourself. So that's always the, the beginning point is starting with who are you, you know, without, I asked the, the very first question, client comes in, they don't know who they are. Say, okay, I want you to write a description, a one page description on who you are, but you can't say anything about I'm a mother. You can't say I'm a father. You can't say my job is. You can't attach it to things. And you also can't say, I think this, or I think that when they, when they get told to do that, usually about three days after I give them that homework, I get a text from them. I don't know what to put. And I'm like, now you, now you see what I mean by you don't know yourself. You don't even, you don't even know how to describe yourself without attaching it to something else, which means when those things get removed from your life, who are you? You know, if your business goes away, who are you? And once they start realizing they need to do the work, that's when the work actually happens. Because like, let's discover. People get excited for it at that point. They're like, okay, I don't even know what my needs are. Let's discover what my needs are. Let's discover what my boundaries are. What are my expectations for relationship? What is, what is my standard of how I want to be treated? When we start labeling them and using words, then when it comes up in a relationship where you're just dating somebody, you can ask questions. Because you know yourself, you can ask them how they would interact with you on different things. But again, it goes back to knowing yourself first. So that way you can communicate who you are to another person. So can you give me an example of like what would be something that someone says is a need that they have or like how would they describe themselves in a, in a good way or okay. like not in a good way, but. In a way that I can, I can help them understand. Okay. Yeah. So the biggest one I always use, because a lot of the women that come and because I have, I have about 60% women and about 40% men that I, that I coach, the women all almost always say one of two things. Words of affirmation is one of their needs in a relationship. And they say physical touch. And I say, okay. I said, so if your boyfriend was mad at you and he came over and started rubbing your arm, right? Would you feel loved? And there are a lot of them will say, no, I, I wouldn't. I'm like, okay, well, what is it about a touch that makes that touch impactful to you? And they're like, well, I have to feel safe. I have to feel like he loves me. Okay. Again, what is, what is that? Let's describe that. Let's get the words that go along with it. And what I found is that we all have like three or four basic needs as far as a relationship. And then we have what I call ancillary needs, the ones that support it. So when that client tells me touch is important to them, I say, okay, well, what do you need for it? And it usually almost always the first thing they say is I need to feel safe and comfortable in the relationship. Okay, we're getting some, we're still diving further and we're going further back. Well, what makes you feel safe and comfortable? Well, if he's calm and he's quiet when he talks to me, he doesn't yell at me, doesn't talk down to me. It's like, now we're getting somewhere. You want a certain way that a man is going to treat you. Now we're putting words to it. And once we put words to it, we can then spot it easier when we have a partner that's not doing those things because we know, because we've defined it already, you know? So, you know, what is, what is the role of um, like judging here? Like you're, you're in, you're seeking a new relationship and, you know, is it right to go into a situation and be like, just assessing so heavy, so hard in the beginning? How does this like 
get to feel natural instead of it being like, I'm on an interview right now and I'm in like hunting mode. And I yeah. mean, how do, how do you just be normal? Yeah, that's the, that. And that is the hardest part. But again, when you know yourself, you start to become more comfortable when yeah. you, when you start understanding who you are, you suddenly start to gain actual confidence. So many people think they have confidence, but again, they're attaching it to the idea of what they think of the world how they relate to the world. They're not attaching it to themselves. So their confidence in themselves has nothing to do with anything about them. So when you get them to start realizing who they are, they start calming down. You'll see people that are super fast talkers suddenly start to go, I'm okay with myself. I understand myself. And so they have no problem getting in a dating relationship and just exploring it, letting it go. And when they see something that's out of place, that's when they can set that boundary. It makes it much easier because a lot of times we think, oh my gosh, that's a red flag. Well, maybe you're just not understanding that person. So you got to ask some questions. Well, once you start asking questions, they may have something that they're doing that you don't like. They're like, oh my gosh, I want to get rid of that habit. And you're like, oh, well, great. If you're going to get rid of that habit, then maybe we would work. So it's just those little things of being able to calm down at the first couple like weeks. We get so like, oh my gosh, this is a red flag. I'm done. Oh my gosh, this is red. If you did that, we'd all have red flags. And you, I mean, if you're a hammer, everything's going to be a nail. So if you go into it with kind of this negative aspect that every, all men are pigs or all women are dogs or whatever words you want to use, like it's, you're going to find it. That's what you're going to find. So by doing the self-awareness, so to kind of back up, I have a, a, a plan of how I do clients. We talk about the self portion of it, which is usually the first three to four weeks with a client. We talk about the self. Then we talk about how we're projecting that out into the world, Right. And then we talk about how we interact. So those are the three parts. So if we know ourselves, then we can project better. But if we don't know ourselves, we're projecting out there and we're getting the type of energy that we're projecting. So if, we're got, we've, if we've got this negative attitude going into dating and we're like, oh, I'm going to see red flags. I guarantee there's going to be something wrong with this guy in the first date. You're going to find it every single time. And you're not going to do any digging to figure out more about that person to understand anything about them because you're projecting out negative energy. But once you know yourself, now you're going to start projecting true confidence, which in, in my opinion, a lot of people don't agree. There is a vibrational frequency between things in this world. And when you are on a higher wavelength and you are in a more positive state, things just become a magnet to you. They really, really do. And you've done the self-awareness work. You know yourself. Now you're vibrating in a positive frequency. You're excited to go on dates. You're excited to learn about other people and see how you can interact and relate. And then you can, because you can communicate, the interaction portion becomes that much more fulfilling. I've had plenty of dates and plenty of people that have gone on dates and client-wise that have come back and said, you know what, even if it wasn't, no, wasn't the person for me, I had a great time with that person because we interacted, we understood each other, but we just understood we weren't good for each other. You don't see it as a red flag anymore. You just see it as they have different preferences than me. They live their life differently than me. You don't have to go around so angry about, oh, this guy does this. That's a red flag because it then yeah. it translates to more negative energy inside of you too. Yeah. It's really funny because I think um, it's like a coldness that people have. And when I was younger, I used to be this way because I, I would just, I was so unsure of myself that I had to like barricade myself away from people. And if, if you didn't agree with me, I had to cut you off and be cold. And now as I age, I have, I come from this place of like, I don't have to agree with you, but I don't need to cut you off. I don't need to like barricade you. I think the term is like ghosting now where you just like never talk to that person again. And, and it's very, to me, it's immature and it's really, um, it's not helpful to anyone, but at the same time, this is why, this is the world we live in, where if people don't do that work, you can't really have healthy conversations. Like we're allowed to disagree with one another and we can say like, Hey man, you're a good person. I'm a good person, but maybe we're not good for each other. And like, I wish you all the best. Like there's nothing wrong with that. So what, what could you speak on today, like in this world of kind of modern behaviors where we went from saying like, hey, Chris, how's it going to like just texting and then blocking? Like how, how can we improve as a human species to not be so cold? 
communication, 100% communication. We all seem to think that communication is, I say something and you just have to understand it, right? Yeah. And really, when, when you break down what communication is, it's my responsibility as the sender of a message to make sure that, that I say it in a way that you can understand. If yeah. you don't understand, I can't get mad at you for not understanding it. I just have to start learning how to word it differently so that you can. Yeah. Now, your job as the, as the receiver is to ask questions when you don't understand and not make assumptions. There's the problem. That word assumptions comes in a lot, right? When you talk about that barricade, you do it a lot of times because you're assuming you know what that person means because you haven't, you don't know how to manage conflict a lot of times. And so when you don't know how to manage conflict, the immediate reaction is run, right? I don't want, I don't want to deal with it because I would rather not, it's, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to end up with my feelings hurt. We can't deal with emotions at that point because we're afraid we're going to boil over or they're going to boil over. So we just back out because we don't know how to communicate our needs. We don't know how to communicate our ideas and thoughts and realize again, the confidence piece here. If I attach who I am to my idea, right? The reason why I'm going to get mad when you would disagree with me is because you're telling me my idea is wrong. You're telling me you don't like me, but when my confidence is my values, I can throw ideas out there all day long. And it does nothing to me for you to say something negative about my idea because it's it's just my idea. It's not me. You're not. This mad is good. You're not. You're 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 not mad at me, right? But when you attack somebody that has attached themselves to their idea, you're going to topple their entire reality because then they're like, well, then I don't I don't stack up in the hierarchy of life because my idea was crap. I'm crap, right? That's why when you start understanding who you are. You understand what parts are actually you and what parts are just ideas. My ideas can change. You can have an amazing idea that goes completely against anything I've ever thought in my entire life. And I'll explore it with you. We'll ask questions. We'll talk about it. And I'll be like, that's interesting. That's totally against what I've always thought, but I can see your side of it because I'm not attaching my ego to that idea. Wow. I, I hope people like rewind and re-listen to that. Um, that, that was really good. So instead of attaching to an idea and making that like ego attached to an idea, like know who you are, know what you value, know what your principles are. And then when someone is like questioning you about that, like it's, it's not attacking you. It's just communicated out. Maybe there's a misunderstanding or a miscommunication problem. And that's why, you know, I, I just did a really great class with my team today where I talked about business people like the, the businesses of the future will build long lasting relationships with their customers, as opposed to just being cold and transactional. And, you know, when you think about communication, what is cold? It's like texting. I have to do so much interpretation of like what you meant. But if I had you on the phone, I could hear your voice. I could read like your pause. I could read, you know, just the speed of your language. There's so many things that I could pick up on from like a nonverbal communication um, point of view. Um, I think it's very powerful. In, in your uh, teaching too, you talk a lot about, um, you know, intimacy and, you know, the difference between men and women. And I, I wanted for people to like understand this because you, you shared something really powerful where you talked about just people having that mutual understanding for one another where men and women have both have things that they're vulnerable about and we have to like come together and start to understand one another better. Um, and if we don't do that, then we run the risk of just never having a good relationship. What, it, you know, what is the role of intimacy in a relationship? Um, and why is it important that both people get their intimacy fulfilled, both the man and the woman? Okay, if you imagine, well, I'll start from the man's perspective. I, I can't really speak to the woman's perspective because you guys are more of an emotional creature than, than men are. But when it comes to men, imagine that we're going outside every single day and we're wearing literally a suit of armor everywhere we go. Imagine like the bomb text, the EOD bomb text. We've got that suit of armor on. And so the role for intimacy for us 
it's not just a sexual thing. And a lot of, in a lot of people, I got a lot of flack for that video I put out the other day about when a man can't be vulnerable with you emotionally, he'll turn to just sex. And it is the case a lot of times, but it's because we have to wear that suit of armor out all day long. We get home and we're exhausted and we need a safe place to be able to express our emotions and be able to say things like I'm struggling, right? Or I'm lost, or I don't know what to do. The problem that happens though, is a lot of women, they see that as a signal to say, oh, this guy's not confident. He doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, oh my gosh. Like he is, he's emotional. He's sensitive. That's the one place we should be able to be because for the rest of our lives, we have to spend out there being hard to, to compare to other men, to not show weakness when it's cold outside, we've got to be outside or raining on us. You know, we have to be hard men out there. So the role for intimacy is to give us a chance to be able to take that armor off and say, I can relax. I don't have to worry about being, you know, having to put my armor back on against my wife or girlfriend. We need to be able to have a place to be able to, to decompress, you know, and again, it goes back to certain phrases that men will say is I'm lost. I don't know what to do. Right. Or I'm struggling with something. You know, we can't even say that because a lot of times the women will be like, would you just get it together or you're being sensitive? Well, that's where we need to be sensitive. So I think it's the role for men is to have a sp space to be able to say I'm struggling and not be abandoned and or have them look at us like we're crazy or something like that, you know? Um, yeah, I think uh, just for people to know too, like nobody is perfect and like uh, no woman is perfect. No man is perfect. And then you have two imperfect people trying to make a perfect relationship. You're asking for help. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, and it also comes to that once you, once you've done the deep dive on yourself, you understand and can see when somebody else is hurting, so to speak. Yeah. That's when they're good. having a hard time communicating. And so you can give them the little bit of grace that they need. You can say things like, I'm sorry. I know I'm, I'm being a little bit harsh with you. I'm sorry. I, I can, I can draw it back. You know, you can see it already happening in them and you can already see that you're being either overly abrasive or you're being, you know, argumentative and you can take that step back again, because ideas aren't what we attach our confidence to. It makes it easier to communicate because we're not, we're not on edge. As soon as we put words out of our mouth, we're not on edge. Like how are they going to react to this? Cause you realize that idea is not you, you know what I mean? So it makes it easier to communicate women. That's a hard one to really say how intimacy plays for them. Cause I don't know enough about how their brain works. Not a woman, obviously. <laughs> um, and you guys have a lot more hormonal stuff going on than men do. Um, and you know, obviously that time of month makes, you know, another shift that we've got to deal with too. So intimacy, I'd be more curious as to what your thoughts is and where intimacy falls for women. I think it's very like, for me, it's simple. It's just my ability to get close enough to you and for you to not run away. Um, like that's what can draw me more in because for me, and I'm saying for me personally, I just like that that matters to me that that creates like a, a safetyness where that person isn't going to run so then you can get more close to them you can drop your guards and you can be more vulnerable and then get in that closeness because whatever you reveal will not make that person run does yeah, that make sense makes complete sense when i talk when i when i coach men um, one of the things I talk about all the time is because um, I ask them to, to describe what a man's role in a relationship is. And they all want to say, I'm a protector, I'm a provider, right? That's the typical ones you hear in society. But I say, okay, what about emotional like space? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, your job is to create emotional safe space. And then the woman fills it. And they're like, what are you talking about? I was like, you have to give a space for your woman to be able to be like messy as hell. You need to give space for her to be able to cry and not like say anything to her. And they're like, what, what does that look like? I'm like, basically all you're going to do is allow her to have emotions and then don't say anything. That's literally all you have to do. And we talk about it when I talk about uh, grief counseling, because um, I've been through a couple of uh, grief counseling courses and the best thing you can do is just sit with the person. Right. And so when women are getting highly emotional, it's not necessarily grief, but it mimics grief. And the best thing you can do is just sit there and be like, I'm here. I'm going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. Dude, would yeah. you like to hug? That's it. And, and I think that's the role in, as far as intimacy with men is that 
they need to realize they have to provide that for the woman. Otherwise, she's going to be a mess and she's going to be coming at you at 100 miles an hour because she wants that and you're not giving it to her. Or we become guarded and we back off because and then there's no intimacy because there's, you know, there's there's that separation instead of closeness. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really good. You know, I this I could talk to you for probably five more hours about this stuff, but just like wrapping up everything, because you're going to get a lot of people that reach out and, you know, want to do the in-depth work, which I think is incredibly, incredibly important. And I totally advocate for this because we need to heal whatever's going on. So the world is filled with people having healthier relationships, but I did want to get your um, opinion on what is social media doing to our relationships today? Um, because for me, uh, I find it to be a place where I see it as a tool and I use it to like to build, but at the same time, I see how social media destroys people. And it's very unfortunate because if someone's hurting in today's world, they don't have a conversation with a person to heal or they don't sit down by themselves and say like, what just happened there? What can I learn? They go to social media, they read like some funny memes and they're like, your boyfriend's an asshole if he doesn't call you in the morning. And you're like, I knew he's an asshole. And it's like, yep. what we're, we're watching these memes and these funny things are just to me, in my opinion, destroying relationships. So what would you say? Cause you're in this space of relationships. What would you say it's doing for that? And then also for options. Like, I think we have this false sense of increased options. And so we don't work out with who we're sitting in front of, and we're just going to the next thing, or we're shutting down. And we're saying, I don't need to put up with this. Like I can have, you know, access to whoever I want, which is not really true. It's called like an illusion of options, which is what social media presents itself with. What are your thoughts on that for today in modern relationships and for people to just approach that with caution? Um, this is a sensitive topic and it's got so many different angles and so many different things going on. Um, when it comes to how it's kind of rela ruining relationships, it's bad information. And we're not, you know, when, we're, when we were in high school, at least for me anyways, I was told when you want to do research, you research and then you have to cite where you get the information from, right? Yeah. You have to understand where you're getting your information from. We don't do that. We get a meme that, that has been circling around. Like the, the, the biggest one I hear is uh, when you want to get over somebody, get under somebody. That is the most terrible advice. It Does it work to, as far as getting over that person? Yes. But you're now creating more trauma for more people. You're going to bleed on more people. And you're, it, it's like this, it's like an infection. It spreads. One person touches another. And that person touches two people and that person touches two people. So the source of bad information creates one person that he thinks, oh, my trauma made me funny. No, no, your, your trauma didn't make you funny. The fact that you're unhealed is making you funny and it's hurting other people. And so then that person goes out and dates two or three, four or five other people and hurts all of them because he's not healed. Then those people turn around, they're unhealed now and they've got to, they do the same thing. And it's just this ripple effect of nobody doing the work that they're supposed to do when a relationship ends. When we were in high school, you broke up, you, you went two weeks of like kicking rocks. You didn't have any other options. You, you sat at home because now you didn't have anybody to call. You know, you didn't, you didn't have a cell phone to get on to, to, to cope at all. You had to sit with your emotions. We don't know how to sit with our emotions anymore. You know, I, at least once a day, turn all social media off, turn everything off and just sit and just veg. And, and I think about everything that's happened th during the day. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's, it's insane. I will say the biggest problem with social media and cell phones in general, the hyper communication, I call it right back in the day, you go on a date, you get off that date and you usually went 24, 72 hours before you talk to the person, right? That allows your ability to let the dopamine come out of your brain before you start making a decision on that next date with that person. However, that's not what we do. We get on the, the texting. We're texting them immediately after you just got done with the date. You get home 
and you're immediately texting him. You're not giving your time, your brain time to process all of the in the little signals that you saw when you were on that date, because the dopamine was was got you looking one way, but you're not you're missing the actual red flag that's on the other side because you're so in tune with this, right? It's why we hear the term, oh my God, I've never felt this connected to you any to anybody. Oh my gosh, like this is the best date ever, right? We get the dopamine but we don't wait 24, 72 hours before we talk to him again. And so we continue that dopamine response and we're not talking from actual logic. We're talking from, from emotion that we shouldn't be talking from, you know? So that, that not waiting, we're not sitting with our emotions. We're not sitting with what happened. We're not allowing our brain to process. We're immediately throwing more information at it. And then the, the stuff that we should have processed gets stored in the back where we don't even see it. And then six months in, you're like, I don't know how I didn't notice the red flags because you weren't taking the time to process the information like you should have been. You know, you're overlooking red flags because your brain saw it, but had to compartmentalize and say, well, he told me I was pretty. So I'm going to focus on that and not focus on the red flag. And so we miss it every single time because we're not taking that breath, not taking that time to sit with our emotions and really think what did happen on that date. Yeah, that's really good. And I say this to people all the time, first thing in the morning, like spend time with yourself and you'll have a better day, you know, you, you know, and it's just amazing what you can do when you're charged up like a battery with like good stuff. So when the day squeezes you, well, good stuff will come out, you know? So yeah. that's a, that's a good thing. You know, Chris, this was a, a great um, session for us. And uh, for a lot of people today that are you know, really starting to understand, like, I need to go deeper. I can't just do the surface work. I have to like really spend time. Number one, you got to spend time with yourself. You've got to invest money to get around better minds and better people. Um, because, you know, some of us are not trained to even know how to process our thoughts. And then you're teaching yourself like the worst possible things. So get around better people. That's why you, you got to pay to play. If you want to go to a higher level, Absolutely. pay up. Um, and then, you know, just for people to understand, like um, one of the things that I really liked about you and, and why I asked you to come on the podcast is just your relationship with, um, with God, um, I think is incredibly important. And it's really nice to hear you say those things because for a lot of people, you know, my personal view is that you have a spiritual component to your life that if that's not filled, you will be looking for other people and other things and substances to fill that void. And that's a very dangerous path to be on. So that's why I wanted you to come on this um, episode and just, you know, advocate for people reaching out to you because I think that's an important part of the conversation about relationships. What is your relationship to something greater than yourself so that you can be really whole as a person? And so, you know, if I'm in this situation right now that I want to get good with my relationships, um, how would I reach out to you? How would I contact you? How would I get to learn more about what I can do to start this process going with you. Where can we um, find you, Chris? You can either find me on uh, Instagram at uh, true North motivation, or my uh, website is tncoachingcollective.com. The, the website's got a whole store of stuff. It's got all my, my services as far as coaching. Cause I do life coaching, fitness coaching, nutrition, I even have one called coaching to therapy to help people get to the right therapist the first time to navigate the, the health system, because obviously paying for, for therapy is kind of hard for some people. So I figure out ways around that form, but everything else is on there. It's got my biography and everything that I've done in my life on there. Um, and just a general, like what, what we do over there uh, on my website. Well, it's really great. And thank you again for your service. Uh, in the military and then your service to um humans around the world you know i know it's gonna yeah. it's gonna make an effect so i just want to say for everyone um i only i really do look into people that i bring on and have conversations with so i just want to say thank you for your time today and thank you for sharing your expertise with the world so that we can make the world a better place thank you for that absolutely thank you for having me on thanks